Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that officiating a wedding over the weekend. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. And that marriage was not between Austin Slater and the Chicago White Sox. Yeah. Uh, what would that mean, officiating? I guess like the league office has to officiate the contract that was apparently reportedly signed or will soon be signed between Austin Slater, platoon superstar, and the worst team in baseball history. That's all we're going to talk about Austin Slater on this Monday edition of Baseball Barbacast. We are going to get into the latest with the Juan Soto meetings to talk about some important dates coming up this week on the baseball hot stove calendar. Talk a little trade rumors, at least. We haven't really had any actual action quite yet. And then we will talk, of course, about the end of the Baltimore era. But Jake, let's begin as we will with most podcasts this offseason with Mr. Jonathan Soto. We have some amount of news, which is that Juan Soto has met with three teams so far, the New York Mets, the Toronto Blue Jays, and the Boston Red Sox with the expectation that the New York Yankees, the team he was employed by in 2024, will be meeting with him early this week. Not an expectation. That is confirmed. Aaron Boone said that there's a meeting on the books between Soto, his agent Scott Boris, and Hal Steinbrenner and co., there will be lunch. Okay, they're going to do a meeting. That's happening. Love that. Love that um, for them. Before we laugh about the news of these meetings, do we think there's a chance he signs with a team that he doesn't meet with? Um. Uh, hmm. Well, so I guess we'll just like bring the Nationals into this conversation. I know I keep kind of forcing them into it, but... You know, there could be meetings that we don't know about. Um, There could be more meetings to come in the future. Now, I think based on the timing of this and all the reporting is that we are trying to kind of move this along and we are not expecting this to drag into, you know, uh, you know, into January, let alone maybe even past the winter meetings. So I suppose it's possible if he has interest in another team and they are willing to give him an offer without some sort of get to know you situation which, of course, he maybe would need less with the Washington Nationals. So I guess that would be an option. But otherwise, I feel like probably not. Quickly on the Nationals and how their meeting would go. For the non-Yankee meetings, it's Juan Soto walking in, shaking out his hand, and introducing himself. I'm Juan. And then the you know uh, John Schneider, the manager of the Blue Jays, goes, I'm John. For the Nats... It's Soto walking into the room and like hugging Davey. Yes, Martinez, it's hugging Davey. It's hugging Mike Rizzo. And then it's, all right, so what's changed since I left? And they're like, hey, remember hearing about that really tall guy that we traded you for? He's now on our team and he's really good. His name is James. <laughs> Can you teach him how to actually hit the baseball hard? Because everything else. <laughs> and, then, and it's like, hey, remember, when we, remember when we sucked? both at the end of your tenure uh, and then after you left. Yeah, so because of that, we got this other guy. His name is Dylan. <laughs> He's also, also in the outfield. Also good. The best uh, part so, is we don't yeah. even need you to play center ever <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so the Nationals are a fascinating character in the Juan yeah, sweepstakes, just lurking. But let's sure. push them to the side because yeah. he has not met with them yet as far as we know. The three teams that have sat down with Juan Soto and exchanged words with him are the Toronto Blue Jays, not even American, the Boston Red Sox, and the New York Mets. And when these meetings happen, it is protocol for some sort of nugget from the meetings to make its way to the public. And this is what we have. John Heyman reports, quote, impressive in-person presentations from the Toronto Blue Jays. The Red Sox, Soto was, quote, impressed, unquote, by their presentation per Sean McAdam. And with the Mets, quote, all early signs suggest the meeting went extremely well per John Heyman. Jordan, which of these three indicates to you where Soto is going? Um, None of them. However, I do think we need to just contemplate why this is not information. The fact that they are meeting is information. We appreciate the reporting that is done to confirm that these sit-downs did happen. That I do care about. 
Sure. I don't really see a scenario. In fact, I would like to kind of find any precedent of any free agent meetings, which get reported on often, not necessarily always the guy at the very top, where the response is, "Mm, yeah, no, he was bored. He was angry at one point. He did not like his appetizer at the Michelin star restaurant that we went to. Like, the, what is, and also, why would we get any sort of other information? If this information is leaking, why would it ever be negative? That is the question. I l- right. And I love the idea of Juan Soto met with the Yankees and the result was, quote, catastrophic. Or like, <laughs> it, he was abhorrently bored. He fell asleep and had to be roused by Aaron Boone from his slumber. Think about the flow of information. The incentive of any of this information getting out. Why would uh, Scott Boris and Juan Soto want anyone to think that every meeting went other than great, right? Because all of this is negotiation, right? If the Red Sox were, if the news coming out of the Red Sox uh, meeting was, wow, that was a disaster, the Yankees are going to be like, okay, great. We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Not that they're going to well, worry about it. We have to it. offer and, less. Right, right, right. Now, again, how much is that going to impact other teams, uh, you know, actual negotiations? Who's to say? But that's, that's remember, that's that's the motivation behind all of it. And the same thing for the team standpoint in terms of leaking anything is, you know, you don't want to be embarrassed. And so I'm sure you want to be like, yeah, he was he was smiling and nodding along the whole time. We crushed it. <laughs> if I'm the Yankees, I could go into my meeting and I could say, Juan, you're a bum. Your mom's a bum. Your brother's a bum. (laughs) Everyone you've ever met is a bum. Here's $675 million. And Juan would be like, meeting went well. I am a bum. (laughs) I am indeed a bum. (laughs) Right. And Uh, this is why the Juan Soto free agent sweepstakes is different than the Roki Sasaki or first time mm -hmm. Shohei Otani sweepstakes, where it was like, the presentations in those circumstances matter a ton because it's not about the money. And so you're selling the organization and what you can offer. Yeah. That is not necessarily imagine. the case here. If Soto gets a call at the 11th hour of his free agency from a team that he hasn't met with and the number's right and the money's right, chances are it'll be in the mix. Yeah. Here's the other thing about that in terms of comparison, comparing it to Sasaki, which is interesting. Like, Sasaki will, it, assuming he is going to go through the process of like actually sitting down with more than, you know, two teams, he will absolutely be learning things. And it's not that Juan Soto is not learning things, meeting with Toronto and Boston, but he's been a big leader for six years. Like he is going to, he's going to be able, he's going to already have a pretty sense. He's played in all these stadiums. Like he understands at least what, sure, there's behind the scenes stuff and the spring training complex and the resource staff and the analytics, all those things. Sure, fine. But for the most part, is he, how much is he really learning? It's more about actually sitting down and getting to talk to another, you know, person in, in another team, which is just not an opportunity they normally have. There's one other element about these meetings I want to bring up, but uh, if there, is there anything else uh, that you wanted to hit on here? Do you remember how important it was last winter when Otani went to Dunedin to see the Blue Jays spring mm-hmm. training complex and was impressed with all of the things they had? And then he signed with the Dodgers. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Uh, the last thing about this, which is sort of related to what you just brought up, is if we're contrasting it with Otani, what was what was the other part of the Otani meeting? Meetings, non-meetings. I oh, don't don't tell anybody. He might hold this against you, right? Dave and Roberts. Dave Roberts. <laughs> Dave Roberts in uh what began to be a, a year of honesty from Dave Roberts, which God bless him. Uh, Good like, year yeah, we, for honesty in America. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. At least for Dave. Dave Roberts was like, Yeah, we met with him. And everyone was like, No, Brandon Gomes was like, I don't know what he's talking about. Oh my gosh. Anyway, I bring that up because Alex Cora <laughs> was uh, asked about going to meet with Juan Soto, I believe. Uh, this is some good reporting from our uh, good friend, Chris Cotillo. <laughs> and, um, the quote from Cora was when he was asked about it, people seem to love Juan Soto and his shuffle. He said he was like smirking and they said, I can't say I went or not. Obviously, there's a process in place. <laughs> so this is another example where he's like, I don't know. Maybe I was there. 
who's to say? And it's like, what are we, what are we doing? Because clearly this one, especially with Boris being in charge, that's the other thing, right? With the Otani, with, with CIA and the way they were handling it, whether it was actually secretive or not, it was a different process. Boris is the opposite. It's like, here's who's me. It, it is a, it is a parade. It is like, here's how it's going. And we will get these goofy updates along the way, which we can appreciate because we can laugh about them on our podcast as we wait for stuff to actually happen. I hope you met with him, Alex Cora. The yeah. alternative would be concerning. Right. If you're interested in Juan Soto, the manager of the team should be in the meeting. And so that, yeah. in my mind, the least is a very good thing. Enough about Juan Soto. Actually, no, that's not true. One more Juan Soto thing. So I did officiate this wedding over the weekend, and I'll talk a little bit about that later because I almost really screwed it up. And when you're meeting new people of a certain age at a wedding, say, and they find out you work in baseball, say. <laughs> and a lot of the people are Yankees fans, say. Mm. I don't know if you've had this specific experience, say. Is Juan Soto really worth it? Someone will ask. The defense isn't that good. He's not that fast. Should they be spending that money on him? Isn't it better allocated elsewhere? And let me say this to you, my dear listeners. If you are presented with this situation, the response is, actually very simple. You say, did you watch the home run he hit against Cleveland? No one else can do that. No one else in the world can do that specific type of thing of working in at bat, of making the pitcher sweat, of providing unfettered stress in the brain of the opponent. And so, yes, his defense is bleh. He is not a good base runner, but there's only one Juan Soto. Perhaps I am unfairly extrapolating. However, I am reading that logic and talking yourself, particularly from Yankees fans. I cannot understand that at all from like fans of other teams who would love to have Juan Soto, obviously. It's almost like the anticipation of like starting to wrap your minds around them not getting him. <laughs> so you can be like, ah, oh, well, it wouldn't have been worth it. It's fine. We're good. I'm chilling. Not my problem. His defense sucks. I didn't want him on my team anyway. It's like, no, um, I don't believe you. And I don't believe what you. What are the Yankees, what are they trying to do? Win championships. And what does defense yeah. do? I believe defense <laughs> oh. wins championships. So you know what Juan defense Soto, also does? Defense also loses championships. As, we as the Yankees showed us. Yes, in game five. All right. Let's move on to other things that we have coming up this week, including one bit of news. A uh, couple things that are happening this week. Some deadlines, important deadlines in the offseason calendar. The first one comes on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern when the players who received a one-year $21.05 million qualifying offer, which teams can offer free agents. Jake, are you going to ask what a qualifying offer is? I'm going to explain it very quickly. Oh, you're going to tell us even better. All right, I'll sit back. Go for it. What's a QO, my friend? If I'm a free agent, my team can offer me, with some certain exceptions, a qualifying offer, which is a one-year contract at a certain level that changes every year. If I accept that qualifying offer, I return to the team. If I decline it, that qualifying offer is then allows the team that lost me to reap a draft pick as a reward for losing me as like compensation. And then if the team that signs me has a certain level of things, they then lose a draft pick at a certain point in the draft. So the idea of the qualifying offer is to um, balance things out for the teams that are signing and losing free agents. Now, most of the time, a free agent that receives a qualifying offer declines it because Juan Soto is not signing for one year at $21 million, right? Right. But then there is a level of player where it is a very beautiful, perfect match where that one year, $21 million offer makes sense for team and player at this juncture in the offseason. And that is the case with Nick Martinez, Reds hurler, who accepted the QO reportedly earlier this weekend. 
Yes. And Nick Martinez is a guy who I think intrigued us in sort of that second or third tier of starting pitcher market just because he quietly had an awesome season. And I can understand why a lot of people maybe didn't notice that. However, at the same time, was it likely he was going to be making $21 million AAV this year? No. What this says to me is that Nick Martinez was very comfortable in Cincinnati. And at age 34, maybe he was not, you know, they, they were allowed to, of course, survey the market over the last couple of weeks, was not maybe getting the multi year offers he was seeking. And he probably thinks, all right, I'm just going to go do that again. And I'm going to get another multi year deal next year. I like being in Cincinnati. And I'm, I believe I want to play for Terry Francona. That sounds like a good time. And I'm just going to come back and, and do this again. And then even at, you know, age 35 next year, I'm going to kind of go for a, a multi year deal next year when he won't have the QO attached. You can only get the qualifying offer once in your career. You can also not receive it if you have been traded during the season. So Jack Flaherty, for example, unable to receive a qualifying offer each of the last two seasons because he has been traded uh, at both deadlines. But most of the guys at the top of the, of the free agent list have qualifying offers attached. Most of them will decline it. Martinez might end up being the only one to accept it. He is now the Reds' highest paid player, but also he was one of their best pitchers this season. It is going to kind of spark some interesting decisions for them in, in terms of payroll, which we can maybe get into a little bit later with some of the trade stuff they have going on. Um, but I do not. I mean, of the other people that got it, I don't know if we're expecting basically anyone else to take it. There was some reporting that Severino, who received it, is likely to decline it, as well as Nick Pavetta, who are both kind of in that Nick Martinez range of starting pitcher. And so if not them, I wouldn't expect really anyone else to accept it. The difference is that they're younger, right? And so they're more likely to receive a multi-year offer. Again, mm -hmm. Nick Martinez, the opposite of sexy. Third in wins above replacement, according to baseball reference, on the Reds last season behind Hunter Green and Ellie De La Cruz. Yep. So he is a good player. He's a good pitcher. It makes sense. But like you say, because he is going to take up a big chunk of their budget, their payroll, it could facilitate another move to open up some more money. And we will talk a little bit more about Jonathan India later. The other deadlines this week. There is a 40-man roster deadline at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. Now. Jordan, why does this 40-man roster deadline matter? This is basically players, when they are in the minor leagues, can only be in the minor leagues for a certain number of years before they must be added to the team's major league 40-man roster, or else they will be exposed to the Rule 5 draft, which takes place during the winter meetings. The Rule 5 draft is essentially a mechanism that was put in place in baseball many decades ago to ensure that players do not get players who are ready to contribute at a major league level, according to you know other teams, do not get trapped in the minor leagues for a long time. And so teams have to decide whether they are going to add players to the 40-man. And if they don't, then they can be selected from other teams in the Rule 5 draft. Of course, the Rule 5 draft, if you take a player, you need to keep them on the major league roster if you're going to keep them. We'll talk about the Rule 5 draft when we get there next month. But what that means is this is an important date because teams will be adding prospects to their, to their rosters some of which you're their top 100 prospects and recent top picks. And you know, like, okay, yeah, we, we knew he was going to get added because he's very much in the team's plans in the next couple of years. But Colson to me, Montgomery, yep, Colson Montgomery, Montgomery for the White Sox, who yep. was a first round pick, top 15 prospect in baseball, really good in the Arizona Fall League, someone who you've probably heard of. He is like the epitome of a shoe in to be added to the 40 man. Yes. And as Pipeline tracks it very well, over the past nine seasons, all 94 top 100 prospects who are eligible to be added got added right so there's the obvious ones that will get added more interesting to me is not just who doesn't get protected and is maybe rule five eligible it's the guys you maybe haven't heard of that are being added because this is one of the few times when the major league team has to make a decision to communicate publicly this is a player we believe in this is a player that that will be in our plans that we believe deserves a roster spot even if they don't think that they're necessarily going to contribute in 2025 this is not someone we want to give away and those players aren't necessarily the ones you always expect it's not just it's not like they're picking on them based on whether they're on baseball america or mlb pipeline's top 30 list it's based on what they think of them and there have been countless examples over the years where you see teams add players and you're like huh like you look at the stats and you're like, why did they add this guy? And and that is a really, really fun process for dorks like me to kind of dig in and be like, why is this player important? So that would be what I would encourage people, fans of these teams is like, sure, you'll get the obvious ones for sure. 
Owen Casey with the Cubs, um, you know, Zach Veen with the Rockies, guys we'll see. And then, yes, there's the other way where it's like, you know, kind of failed top prospects or failed top picks who end up being, uh, you know, left unprotected and then probably aren't getting picked in the Rule 5 because they're not having good minor league careers. But it's those guys that do get out of that you haven't necessarily heard of. Digging in on those guys is always a very, very fun part of this deadline. When Jordan Schusterman in a year from now or two years from now, is like, I remember when I first learned about player X and he's early on a rando who's contributing in the World Series. That process often starts here. Yes. Like, as an example, there's a guy the Orioles have, Baltimore Orioles, named uh, Alex Pham. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alex Pham is like back half of their 30, really loose right handed pitcher, undersized, the not big velocity. Do the Orioles think Alex Pham will like be in their bullpen or a depth starter this year? If they do, they're going to add him. If they don't, they won't. And now, is this very literally inside baseball? Yes. But if you <laughs> want to nerd out at the level that we're nerding out, the 40-man deadline is a great way to do that. One more deadline yes. before we get out of here. And this one is actually a little bit more accessible. And this is the non-tender deadline. Now, me personally, and Jordan, we are always tender towards one another, very open about our emotions. It's important. However, teams are not always like that. What the non-tender deadline means, if you are an arbitration-eligible player, or even pre-arb, I can yeah, choose. Yeah, I mean, it's really about it never the arb, happens, guys. But right. Yeah. If you're an arbitration-eligible player, that means pre-free agency, and you're making you know anywhere between like $1 and $10 million, I can choose as a team to simply not tender you a contract. Now, that would then make you a free agent, right? Why would I do that? Well, I think that the dollar number that you are going to demand in arbitration is not worth it. And I would rather simply not have you on the team. Famous non-tender candidates, Kyle Schwarber. This is, to me, the wildest one. Is the Instead of paying Kyle Schwarber like $12 million one year, the Cubs were like, nah, we're good. And he just ended up as a free agent. Yes, free agent earlier than expected, right? So obviously you'd say, well, that sucks for the player. But in some cases, they end up getting to become free agents earlier than they would have expected, which can give them an opportunity to you know, sign earlier. Maybe they're younger hitting the market. So we will have those. Now, that'll be on Friday. That'll probably happen after we record on Friday. So this is probably going to be more of a discussion next week. But there's going to be a lot of news around this. And of course, this is a big part of teams. If, if you're really wondering why most free agent activity does not start until really after this date. It's because this is really when teams' budgets are being clarified because there are going to be teams that are deciding, oh, actually, we now have 10 more million dollars to work with because we non-tendered three guys. And that ha that has not happened yet. And so because of that, that's why teams have not really necessarily made their aggressive financial uh, moves that we that we expect. So obviously at the top guys, you know, there will be also, you know, guys like Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who will, of course will be tendered a contract and he's going to end up making a ton of money. But for the most part, those that that next level, it's hard. It's a, sometimes you can project them. But I'm sure we'll be having those conversations during this week, but that is definitely an important one with names that you will absolutely recognize as suddenly joining the free agent pool. So one player, as an example, that a team is certainly discussing is um, Trent Grisham with the Yankees, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Trent Grisham, I'm just giving an example. Trent Grisham is projected for $5.7 million per MLB trade rumors. Is Trent Grisham worth $5.7 million? Probably not, right? Can the Yankees pay that? Certainly. The Yankees now can make a decision to just simply not have Trent Grisham on the roster at $5.7 million. His contract leaves the books. He becomes a free agent. They can use that money elsewhere, right? Now you yeah. just go take that money and go get like Manny Margot or something for like right. $800,000 or 1.5 mil or whatever. That calculus becomes a lot more important for teams that have lower payrolls. So another mm -hmm. example would be the mm -hmm. Orioles have Gregory Soto, a hard throwing left-handed reliever, uh, arbitration eligible, I think around five and a half million. That's a decent chunk of change for a reliever for a team like the Orioles where we don't know where the budget's going to be. Yeah, so Atlanta. It, Atlanta well, is another team to watch, right? Ramon Laureano. Um, and then I believe there was 
one other name for them that I was watching. But uh, yeah, they, they're a team that we know are kind of clearly have very specific uh, budget goals in mind, and, and they could be making some decisions there. And it can flood the market with a number of other players mm-hmm. who maybe wouldn't end up on the top 50, but certainly players who will end up contributing mm-hmm. In the big leagues. Yeah, Griffin Canning. Season. Griffin Canning was the one. I know they just acquired him, but that's one that has been speculated as maybe they could just have, a you know, $11 million. They could just probably project to just clear that if they are so inclined. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we get back, we will pop open a can of trade rumors. And welcome back to Baseball Barbacast. If your cupboards are bare and you're hungry and there aren't any transactions going on, you might grab a couple tote bags and head on down to Trader Joe's. This is a segment where Jordan Schusterman, who the first two letters of his name are J-O, tells us what trades are going to happen. Oh, oh, I see. Trader Joe. Joden. Trader Joe. Joden. Joden. All right. Interesting. All right. We'll work on that. Um, so let's talk about trades. Trades are so much more fun than signings. So let's just get that out of the way. Way better. Way better. We kind of talked about it with Jeff Passan on Friday. The rush of excitement, the hot stove mm, adrenaline that we receive over the course of the winter is exponentially more enhanced when it is trade related. Because it is, you just do not see it coming. And this is a good way to kind of intro our first player as part of this discussion because we got our first like nugget of a trade rumor that is very compelling and this the reason why we are going to take this one more seriously than (laughs) the ones that fans are just throwing out recklessly on social media every five minutes is that this comes from reporting not just from ken rosenthal but from red speed writer uh, C. Tran Rosecrans, one of the best in the biz. And they suggested or reported that they Reds and Royals are discussing a trade involving Jonathan India and Brady Singer. Now, the reason why I am bringing this up as interesting, I mean, it's interesting in and of itself, but the reason why this is a reminder of why trade season is so fun is because it, at the beginning of the offseason, MLBTradeRumors.com one of our favorite good websites. website, good website, one of the best, one of the best websites. Uh, they put out a list, which they would know, right? Top thirty-five trade candidates of the 2024-2025 MLB offseason. Of course, they do their top fifty for agent list, but they also put together this list. And the people who run this website know is that not only are they tracking the literal rumors, but they are paying attention to the roster crunches involved, and so they are obviously an authority that is going to be able to tell you which players are in a good position to be traded at the top of their list, Garrett Crochet and Ryan Helsley and, you know, Devin Williams. And we're going to talk about them in a second. Neither Jonathan India nor Brady Singer are on this list. And this is not to say that MLB trade room was screwed up. It's just a reminder that over the course of the long baseball winter, these things can come together very quickly. And whether or not Jonathan India and Brady Singer get traded for each other we cannot even begin to conceive of the trades that are actually being cooked up behind closed doors. And when we do get a peek and we do get some strong reporting about what is being discussed, that is always compelling because oftentimes whatever stupid trade you're trying to cook up for your favorite team is not anywhere close as to what is actually going to happen. So let's talk about this one in particular. Whether it happens or not, I do think it's a little bit related probably to the news about Nick Martinez, You know, him expecting the QO. The Reds, maybe their payroll is going to go up a little bit, but we're not expecting them to ex- exactly spend a ton the way that they kind of strangely did last winter. Jonathan India is someone we've been talking about in trade rumors for a while. Him for Singer is a very interesting potential swap, not just because they were you know, college teammates at Florida and not both because they are they are really very they're both two years away from free agency and very much like the same kind of value, just different for their own respective positions. Right. They are not stars, but they are very useful players who are good. Right. And and when you look at these two rosters, you could I mean, I don't know. Does does it seem like the Reds need Brady Sanger more than Jonathan India? I guess he certainly fits more. The Reds do have a lot of pitching coming. 
Jonathan India is an on-base guy that Kansas City is obviously sorely needing. I mean, we've talked about the Royals' offense and how badly they need any sort of, you know, boost. So this could be this could be a fun swap. Maybe it doesn't end up happening exactly like this. Maybe these two players get traded elsewhere. But it is it is an interesting kind of place to start this trade season. You just never know what's going to be. For me, it's that simple. Juan Soto is going to be on a team next year. So he's going to be a lot richer than he is now. I don't know if Brady Singer will be on the same team. And that gives me a little bit more su- suspense to the entire proceedings. I want to dig into a couple other players whose names are interesting. I think Garrett Crochet is above the rest in terms of quality of player that is likely to be traded. Jordan, can you give everybody the spark notes on Crochet? Yeah, so Crochet, obviously one of the the breakout stars of the 2024 season, someone who was kind of scoffed at as the White Sox opening day starter because he had zero starting experience in the big leagues. And then not only did he prove that he could hold up as a starter, he was one of the best starters in Major League Baseball. And when the White Sox were the worst team in baseball at the trade deadline, it was like, well, obviously the worst team in baseball is going to trade some of their best players. What happened with Crochet, even though he was reportedly discussed as a de- at, in, in deals to the deadline, because of his very unique injury history and kind of sped up workload that got to a much higher level than we'd ever seen from him, he wanted a extension to go along with a trade to a team if he was going to pitch you know, deep into October, potentially. Now, he didn't really have the leverage to do so. But ultimately, what it ended up being is that he was not traded. However, the expectation was because the White Sox are still deep in a rebuild and Garrett Crochet is, I believe, two years away from free agency. This is still a player that at this stage for that organization, this is the time that you cash in on him after he's had this amazing season. Now, remember, they tra- a year ago, they traded Dylan Cease two years away from free agency and they got a... a Pretty interesting package from San Diego. Crochet, the season that he just had, I mean, you could argue is every bit as good as the season that Cease has had, and he's a lefty. However, there's a lot more risk that comes with Crochet. So we're going to kind of have the same discourse as we had in July. He is likely still going to be seeking an extension for a team that he signs with just to kind of get some security because he has such a unique medical history. But the talent here, I mean, he there's very few left-handers <laughs> that are better than Garrett Crochet on his good day at this point. And that is an, an amazing development, regardless of what team he plays for and, and how likely he is to be traded. But it is also why there are teams that are going to look at him and be like, damn, this is a pitcher that if Garrett, I mean, think about it this way. If Garrett Crochet was a free agent, I mean, he's not getting more than Burns. But like in terms of like who you want for the next three, four or five years, him versus Freed versus Snell, you know, versus some of these starters... I mean, certainly over Flaherty, I, I would have to imagine. But what do you what do you think? This is why it's a big deal that he could be on the move. Here's one dumb question for you. Rest of their careers, Garrett Crochet, Garrett Cole. Pick a Garrett. Mm, pick a Garrett C. Uh Garrett Cole. <laughs> it's not that not that hard of a choice for me. But I understand what you're getting at. Because it's not that hard to imagine Garrett Crochet. Have, there's just so much risk baked in. It's it's really to me it's of that course. simple, right? But and then not that there the isn't next, with Cole. Not that there isn't with Cole. Of course, next five years, who compiles more war, Cole or Crochet? I would pick Cole because it's safer. But what's your percentage confidence on that? Fifty eight. Yeah, right. Like a it's little not, higher just because of the bulk. But again, not that Cole doesn't come with his own elbow concerns. So. Yeah, man, I don't know. He is, as he was over the course of the whole season, I I just kind of struggle to even know how to talk about Garrett Crochet because it's just such an extreme. We think about all the, we we talk about the risk with Snell. I mean, my gosh, Crochet is all those conversations about Snell, but magnified to to an extreme degree. I'm very compelled by Garrett Crochet's situation just because it's a very rare example of a player using their leverage where Garrett Crochet knows that the White Sox should trade him. That Garrett Crochet being on the White Sox for the next handful of seasons does not make sense for either the White Sox or Garrett Crochet. That then allows allows Garrett Crochet to dictate his trade process because of how he handled things last year, where he came out and said, I will not pitch for you in the playoffs if you trade for me and I do not get an extension. That kind of wriggled a lot of feathers 
around the league. Like there were pitchers who were like, who does this guy think he is? He's thrown a hundred good innings in the major leagues. And he's saying he won't throw in the playoffs without an extension. But at the same time, it's totally reasonable for Crochet to say that because, you know, his elbow could explode tomorrow and you got to make, what's the saying? You got to make haste when the sun is shining. Oh, I'm not familiar with that, with that, make with hay, that phrase. Gotta make hay. But here, why don't you look that up to clarify your, your metaphor gotta make in hay. there? Yeah. Got to make hay while, while the sun shines. Okay. Because well, you know you why? Because you need hay. You need sun mm -hmm. to dry the hay. Also, right. The sun got to make hay, make money while the elbow is, is functional. I think is the other. That's what they that. say. Um, but also, if he is still seeking an extension, it is much more likely that such discussions could be had now versus on July 28th. It's a lot more complicated at that stage. By the way, we just saw this with Tyler Glass. Like, I would not be surprising at all if we see a very similar sequence to what happened with Tyler Glass now a year ago, where it was kind of part of the discussion. Where it was like, all right, now that was a little bit different, right? The Rays, of course, wanted to do well by Glass now, but they telegraphed, yes, we're going to trade him for sure. So he is certainly a huge one. And, and because as of now, he's still going to be pretty cheap, you know, would you rather spend the money? Would the Red Sox rather give Blake Snell, you know, $150 million or would they rather trade, you know, Kyle Teal for Garrett Crochet? I think we're going to. Find out. <laughs> Maybe they'll do both. You know, who's who's to say? But I think Crochet will remain a main character on the trade market. I would say the two other names that I'm watching very closely are two of the best closers in baseball. One of them is Ryan Helsley with the Cardinals. I sort of introduced the Cardinals as an interesting character to watch, interesting team to watch because they have a bunch of veterans who could be traded. Now, I was mostly referring to the guys who are under contract for much longer, guys like Nolan Arenado, guys like Sonny Gray. I mean, even Contreras, Eric Fetty, another one. Oh, he only has one year. But Helsley is a closer coming off another spectacular season who has only one year left on his contract. And as we've seen, if the Cardinals, as they seem to be hinting, the 2025 is more of a transition year than a we are going for it year, this is the time to trade your closer because you do not know what Ryan Helsley's ERA is going to be in July. Yes, teams will be more desperate to trade for a closer in July, but you do not know what Ryan Helsley's ERA or his health status is going to be in July. And so he's one of the best closers in baseball. This would be the time to cash in. Same thing could be said about Devin Williams of the Milwaukee Brewers, who, of course, are coming off a division title, and he would seem to be a more important part of their success. But as we know, after they decline his team option and are willing to go to arbitration with him and you know pay him a million dollars or $2 million less, where that relationship is with that team would not be surprising if it leads to them being like, yeah, we don't need him anymore. Um, let's save some money. Let's have you know Trevor McGill and Abner Uribe close for much cheaper, and we can trade Devin Williams for some prospects. So I think both of those guys could be very interesting guys on the move this winter. I have one more guy I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I mean, we could again we could speculate on guys all we as we open the segment with we don't know who is going to come up as a trade candidate. There is not an obvious one the way that we had last year with Soto, right? Very early in the offseason, it was like, oh my god, Juan Soto is going to get traded. We don't have, I guess Crochet is that this year. It's the closest thing we have to that. But other than that, we don't know. So we're going to wait for them to come out. But who's the last guy you wanted to mention? Jordan Montgomery is just so fascinating to me. He signs with the Diamondbacks last year late in the winter. Is bad. The Diamondbacks team president comes out and takes the blame and says that it was a giant mistake. Jordan Montgomery opts into the second year of his deal at 22 and a half mil. And now the Diamondbacks like kind of have to trade him because they just trashed him publicly and Montgomery probably doesn't want to go back there, but obviously would for $22.5 million. So there's a chance that he gets dealt and it'll be interesting to see how much of that money the Diamondbacks end up having to eat. I guess the one other one is Nico Horner in Chicago. We talked about this last week. The Cubs have to trade an infielder to make a little bit of room for Matt Shaw, who's their top prospect, who really bangs. Trading for Isak Paredes last year made that more complicated. I think Horner is going to be the one that's most likely to go in a deal. Yeah, he's. Um, I know he's certainly a fan favorite there, and has been exactly what you kind of could have hoped. Maybe, maybe some people thought he was going to have a little bit more power, but Cubs, 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 Cubs. It was not an accident. We talked about him, talked about them multiple times on Friday. Horner does feel like the most likely to move, but I'd be curious to hear from Cubs fans how what they would like to see 
shake out because that's the most logical move that we can see but i'm not sure that's necessarily the ones that cubs fans are going to be happiest with all right we are going to take a, another break and when we return we are going to talk about the death of baltimore before we say goodbye we'll be right back and welcome back to baseball barbacast it is now time to talk about the baltimore orioles a fascinating Friday news dump after we recorded with our dear friend Jeff Passan. Was the news from Mike Elias, the general manager, that the giant Orioles wall in left field, the wall that they pushed back three years ago and decided, ooh, this is a little bit too close. We would like to make this a little bit more favorable to our pitchers because, my gosh, are we allowing a lot of home runs. It might have just been a skill... Skill I was going to say, uh, was that because of the ballpark or was that a skill issue? Who's to say? We are to say. It was more of a skill issue. Anyway, three years ago, the Orioles moved the left field wall very back and up. And now they are going to try and control Z this thing and move it back in. This is a fascinating decision, Jake Mintz. As, a te- as a, someone who watches this team all the time what has your experience been watching this wall torment right-handed hitters over the last three years namely ryan mountcastle and trey mancini i'm so happy for ryan mountcastle here's the problem with the wall is that it reshapes your brain and how it watches baseball because when the ball leaves the bat you are trained to think home run or out. And in Camden Yards the last few years, you have to like second, third, fourth guess yourself as the ball's going out to left. It just felt phony. There were multiple moments during the Orioles' very brief, swift wild card series loss where there were balls cranked to left field. Westberg, by both right? Westberg, yeah. yep. Melendez hit one. And mm. it just, they were both flyouts. And that's stupid. Yes. It should be within the normal range of anticipated outcomes. One of my favorite things about baseball is that all the stadiums are different, that the dimensions are weird and the walls are different heights. And like, that's a good thing. But anything outside that normal range feels cheap or just it doesn't feel like baseball. And I think this is honestly the problem that people have with Yankee Stadium short porch and the other way where like the ball is hit and it doesn't feel like it should be a home run and then it lands in the seats. This was the other way where it was like, if you crank a ball, it should be a homer, right? It really should. And so I'm very happy they're moving the wall back in. Yeah, I mean, I think it is interesting because they didn't, pick the dimensions by accident when they moved it back initially, I would assume. And, but, but they moved it back. When they moved yeah. it back, yeah. everyone's immediate reaction was... Too far. Too, I too understand tall. why you moved yes. it back, but it was too far and too yes. high. Yes. Yes. And I remember when we went there for the first time and seeing in person, like, it was so jarring. It was like, oh, oh, whoa, we're really... I mean, it had to have been one of the most extreme wall... Like, it's they're not the only place to change the wall, change the dimensions. You've seen other stadiums make much more subtle shifts in the gaps, maybe raise it a little bit or or lower a little bit. Like that's happened and that's fine. This was just felt like the most drastic thing. And now we have Michael Eyes saying things like, you know, after the feedback we received, it was a directionally correct move, but we over corrected. And that is that is accurate. Michael Eyes. Can we talk a little more normal, my guy? (laughs) I I quote. Our baseball operations department, after careful deliberation, has decided to pursue modifications to the dimensions of our left field wall in advance of 2025 opening day. Here, I'm going to just translate that for you guys. We're moving the left field wall in. Yeah, it's too far, too tall. So we're we're going to, we're going (laughs) to. Here's the thing, right? Not every quote needs to sound like a press release. The press release should sound like the press release. But the quotes in the press release should sound like a human being talk. Yeah. But I do think that, like, it is interesting. I mean, he there he's really owning this L. Like, I got to say. Which I do appreciate. Yes. Like, there are multiple quotes that you can, like, read from him where it's just like, we, it was in- affecting 
are personnel's feel like not just like how it was literally playing, but it was like how they were approaching. How could it not? Right. We know, you know, saying, I think, you know, doesn't mean we're going to be stubborn. Right. He says, we felt that the, the prior dimensions were harmful for that. I think history bore that out. But that doesn't mean we're going to be stubborn if we overshoot the mark on something. I'm recognizing it and taking this opportunity to adjust. But I do think this over time will help us with our pitchers, our right-handed hitters, everyone. I hope this lands in a spot where our park dimensions are not a topic for player recruitment. Okay. Now we're getting into somewhere here. Not a topic for player recruitment because they have been in different directions before this change, but then also after this change. So that is another part of this, right? If we're trying to recruit Teoscar Hernandez, it's going to be a little bit harder <laughs> if that fence is where it is. Now, you're not moving it specifically for any individual free agent. But yeah, like that is absolutely a thing that players are going to think about. There's no way that that's an accident that, you, that now that they're going to try to start act, being active in free agency that they want to change this. And it the reason that it affects a player's well-being is... Obviously, how good you do at work makes you feel a way. Like Ryan Mountcastle hitting fewer home runs than he would have makes him think less of himself yeah. than if he played in Cincinnati. But it's a dollar figure amount. Because yeah. you get paid in arbitration for your production, if Ryan Mountcastle was on the Reds for the last four years, he'd make, <laughs> what, $2 million more dollars in arbitration yeah, a year? Probably, yeah. Like, yeah. that's a no, lot a huge of deal. trips to the golf course. It's a huge deal. Now, obviously, you know, the pitcher's side of this, just to be clear, they're moving it back in, but it will not be anywhere close. I mean, it is a reminder of how close it was before. Like, it's all warped, but like you go back and watch highlights from 2019 and 2020 and obviously much longer than that. But especially when the ball was flying out of all major league ballparks, boy, did it look close, you know, and left. Hopefully now it will be become something a little bit more balanced. And I think that's obviously what they are, what they are looking for. And I, I will just say... I am curious, like, this will be a very interesting part of history that it's possible some people will forget about in 15 years, but we won't because it was so ridiculously goofy. Uh, but these three years and, and these three park factors, I mean, the numbers spoke for themselves. It's not just anecdotal. Ah, man, that Ryan Mountcastle ball looked like it was going to go out. The park factors were out of control for how hard it was to hit home runs uh, to left field in Baltimore. So that is interesting news. RIP Baltimore and all the other nicknames we had for the giant wall. Uh, Jake, before we say goodbye, story time? Yeah. All right. What what happened this weekend? I officiated a wedding for two very good friends of mine who I introduced to one another. And they asked me to do the wedding, which was really a, an honor and humbling. And I put a lot of thought into it. And I think I did a great job. Uh, except that I almost knocked over the entire chuppah. For those of you who have ever been to a Jewish wedding, it is the uh, Jewish wedding canopy that hangs above the couple. Uh, at one point during the service, Jordan, I um, kind of stepped out of the way to allow someone else to come up. And the sides of the chuppah were like translucent plastic with flowers in the middle of them. And I didn't see it. And I went like full blast shoulder into the chuppah. And the like entire leading, like falling onto it or like kind of hitting. No, like getting out of the way, didn't see it. Do right, like lowering my shoulder into a catcher, tumbling into home, like oh. real force into the and wall it, or into the, the into like one the of the beam. pillars. Oh, into, into one, one of the, the pillars. pillars. Oh no! And it made a huge poof. and then like the whole crowd just goes, oh, oh. it was. But and it did. So it, why? How? Why didn't it fall? Because God got me. <laughs> I'm trying to understand how this didn't go horribly. Like, Me too. That's, that I would don't be... understand how it didn't fall. But it was just one of those moments in life that feels like a sitcom where. Yeah. Yeah. And it was tilted for the rest of the service. Like you could see like Ooh, the chuppah. So you did do damage. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's important to do damage. So first wedding I ever officiated. I think I did a pretty good job besides nearly bringing down the house. A right. But no, thought that, that is, was worth sharing. Yeah. No, chuppah is a big, uh, it's a big wild card for um, for any Jewish ceremony. I mean, for sure. But it's an important one. So I'm glad you, did, I'm glad that you did well enough that it was, it's now it's like a, it's a funny footnote, not like, yeah. oh, and like he sucked. And also he almost ruined the whole thing. 
You know, it was like, oh, Jake did a great job, but oh, he almost, he almost really, he almost did it. Almost, almost did it. totally screwed it up. Yeah. I tell the story to you listeners to remind you that even if you almost knock down the chuppah, <laughs> you can still have a great time dancing afterward. Thank you so much for listening to this episode uh, of Baseball Barbacast. I'm going to go rest my voice and drink yes, some tea. Do that. Do that. We need you ready to, to talk about Paul Skeens and Jackson Merrill uh, on Wednesday. Of course, we have all the awards coming up this week. We will address those as we see fit. Hopefully, we also have some actual news to hit on. We will with all these deadlines. Thank you to producer Andrew Hartz. You can email us at baseballbarbacast at gmail.com. We will talk to you all on Wednesday.